totally fine. So this presentation is one um, on just public history here at UNI and the kind of opportunities that we uh, are starting to offer as a program, but also what public history is as a field generally and other programs that you might be interested in. Um, so my name is Dr. Cheryl Dawn and that is my contact information. I am director right now of the public history here, both uh, the undergrad as well as the graduate work. So what is public history? Um, I probably get asked this a lot. And, you know, to be honest, it is one of the hardest things uh, for me to define as well, because I think it is such a big tent um, and so much work falls into public history. Um, I provide here really uh, the definition by the National Council of Public History, uh, which describes public history as history put to work in the world. In, in numerous ways, and it's history that is applied uh, to real world issues. Um, this could be everything from historians who work on climate change historically uh, to address current environmental problems to people who work in museums or such settings that we might, um, we might be more familiar with today as public history. Um, the two things I really want to note about public history though is that it is always, all, oftentimes, I should say, but almost always very collaborative and it is interdisciplinary. So that people who do public history have to be familiar with uh, history and historiography, but also with things that we wouldn't normally think of, including art history, exhibit design, material studies, uh, cultural heritage studies, and the like. Um, so, as some of you are considering careers in public history, I want to say that because it is such a big tent, you can take your degree and put it to work in many different ways. That said, you really want to tailor your experiences and in internships and in coursework, as well as your own projects, to what track it is that you're really considering. Um, so for instance, if you want to get into curation or uh, collections management, archival work, uh, that is the kind of thing where you want to be pursuing internships um, at this point in um, archives and special collections um, and in the collections uh, of museums. Another way in which public historians go to work in museums and historic sites is through interpretation, right? writing of um, tours, giving tours, exhibit design. Um, and that is its own kind of separate category of work. So that's what you're interested in. Start pursuing internships in that. And as you build your career, you can really think about where it is you want to focus on and who, right? Um, and there are spaces, there are many spaces for public history, including museums and historic sites, but also we're seeing more and more companies uh, wanting to hire historians to do consulting work of some sort or uh, work with the national parks, with historic sites and uh, with libraries. So those are all spaces that we're seeing stuff. And Eliza, for you especially, um, I can put you in touch with uh, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Ann Wisnott, who runs one of these history consulting companies where she doesn't work specifically with one museum, but she's constantly taking on research projects for certain museums, developing exhibits, developing reports on a case by case uh, basis. She can tell you some of the, I think, fun things you can do with that work, as well as maybe some of the drawbacks. But public historians despite how academic historians can sometimes talk about them, um, do very much engage in all the ways we practice history. So um, with, with public history at UNI, um, we have right now uh, two programs at the undergrad level, um, and that would be the public history certificate, which is that 15 credit hours, you have to take History 4010, and then two history or related courses. If you're already a history major, this is uh, this for both the certificate and minor, 
um, all of those other credit hours, including the internship credit hours, can be counted twice. So you can count it towards both your minor and certificate, as well as the major. But I actually highly encourage our uh, public history, our, our history major students um, to get into the public history um, minor, which is the Oh, which is 18 credit hours, you do one more course, History 1010, and then uh, History 4010. And that History 1010 is something you have to do for the history major anyways. Um, it looks like Fernando is having trouble getting on right now. So I am going to do a specific invite to him and hopefully he can get in. Uh, so let me make sure this Dr. Calderon was going to talk about our graduate uh, programs. So, ah, there he is. We'll wait for him to connect. Sorry. <laughs> Problems. I don't know where I couldn't find the, it just wouldn't let me on. It was crazy. So. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I should have yeah. emailed something else out, but I'm glad you got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually you joined at the perfect moment because your slide is oh, okay. coming on. Awesome. So uh, Dr. Catteron, because he's director of graduate uh, studies uh, here in the history department is going to uh, really talk about um, the graduate public history emphasis and the two kind of tracks. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to just go through what are sort of uh, the the requirements and some of the expectations um, were, were you to to want to go through the, the public history route, which uh, I know at least Kelsey is um, going that way. So, um, the website is pretty um, um, self-explanatory, but there are things that I want to emphasize. Um, so there are two courses. There's uh, there's one that you could. One of them is doing a thesis, um, which is um, you know something that involves writing a, an entire process. Actually, it involves writing a proposal, setting up a committee, um, and um, coming up with some you know kind of original idea, right? Uh, and then figuring out if you can if you can do it given the the circumstances, especially right now with with COVID. But in, in if it was a if it was a normal time, um, that's something you would have to take in, take in consideration anyways. So um, and then the second track is a research paper, um, and that is um, you know I'll explain that in a little second. But that's those are the two tracks. So the first one um, is thirty credits, uh, and it involves taking a number of seminars. Um, and uh, perhaps even a readings with uh, your advisor that often happens, at least it's uh, has been my experience. In my case, I do uh, often do readings with, um, with other students, meaning that um, you and, and, and your professor, right, uh, sign a sort of contract, right? You don't really sign a contract, but it's you, you, and you, 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 you create a course based on a theme or a topic, um, and then you just read uh, a compilation of, of both books and articles, and you write book critiques, you meet uh, to, to discuss them. So it, there's a whole wide range of, of, of ways of, of, of actually constructing that course. But anyways, so every student's required to do two things, primarily is take the historical methods course. That is the introduction course, uh, that all first years take when they come into our program. That's regardless if you're a public, you're going the public history route, or if you're actually, um, or if you're just uh, getting an, an MA in history. Um, and then uh, there are a number of seminars that you'll take uh, uh, in addition to that. So it all adds up to um, 30 credits. So I think there's a three electives, three credit elect that you have that you have to take. But in addition to these, there are public history classes, and those classes. 
um, are 500 level or 5,000 level classes, not 600 level classes. So what does that mean? It means that um, you're gonna take that, uh, that course is both undergraduate and graduate, right? And so what happens here is that it depends on the advisor what, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it depends on the, the, um, the actual uh, uh, professor, um, what you're going to do in the course, what usually involves, you know, some extra work, uh, either, you know, a, a longer reading uh, list, uh, a larger research paper, which is sort of a rule of thumb in many ways. Uh, so there's, you know, there is, there is that. Um, you know, when I was in a master's program at the University of Oregon, it, there were these uh, both master's and, and undergraduate classes, um, and they worked out really well. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's still a very, I think, fruitful intellectual experience. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's 30 credits. The, the non-thesis option, um, which is uh, 24 credits, um, and just so I, you know, just so you, just so if I can back, if I can backtrack a little bit, um, 18 of those 30 credits that you take, um, if you're going the, the, the thesis route, have to be in the um, in the history department. Okay, so that's that's very important, or at least must consist of 600 level credits. Um, and uh, but anyway, so the uh, for for the uh, for the non thesis option, um, it's only 24 credits, and 15 of those have to be consist of um, you know 600 level uh, courses or so. Um, and that one, you know, it, it, it still requires you to take the historical methods course and a number of uh, the, the historiography courses, um, the intro to obviously to, to public history, uh, doing an internship. And uh, so you do still, you know, kind of go through the program taking classes and, or seminars with uh, the other members of, of your cohort, okay? They can be also second years as well. So. So there really isn't any difference in that. It's just a, a lesser uh, amount of, of courses that you need to take. Uh, but the if you are if you choose to do a a, a, a research paper, um, the research paper you need to. It's very important that you um, present that uh, or that you tell us that you're going to take that option or going to do the, the research paper or the thesis as soon as possible because there is some bureaucracy that you have to go through um, and it's important to, to get that um, to the graduate school as soon as possible because um, you know things get busy, uh, they get busy and so you don't wanna kind of do this in the, at the last minute because you really, you really can't and you have to get signatures and all these kinds of things. So, so make sure that you're, you, know, you decide which track you wanna do. You can always change it um, but it's good to have some, uh, some idea of what route you're going to take so you can prepare accordingly. So the, the research paper then also entails a, um, a written comprehensive exam uh, and, uh, and then an oral, uh, an oral exam in which a committee of three people, uh, including your advisor, uh, you'll have like a, an oral defense, right? Well, they'll ask you questions about your comprehensive exam, as well as your kind of um, subfield that we also require students to, to have that are going the, 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 the research paper route. Now, I've always been asked, you know, do, do, you know, does it matter which one I do? If I take the, you know, the research paper route, am I, you know, sort of um, getting, taking the easy way out of a, of a master's program? Um, that's, that's obviously that's not necessarily true um, because the research papers do take a lot of time. They're just obviously shorter, um, uh, but the expectations are still, you know, that you're going to produce a, a, a master's uh, graduate uh, school, graduate um, type of, of research paper. So, um, but, you know, if, if, if you're interested in, in, in into going in academia, then, you know, the thesis, the thesis would be the, the most uh, I guess, um, proper route to take because generally if you go on to, you want to go on to a PhD, which a lot of our students have, have gone on to PhDs and have been very successful, uh, that's generally the best uh, route to take. 
uh, because it, it, it looks good on your application as well. And it, it, it shows that you can do research and that you can produce a massive project or a mass project, right? Um, and, uh, and at the same time, you know, sometimes these, uh, your theses, your MA theses, thesis, uh, oftentimes functions or serves as this kind of um, uh, foundation for what your dissertation will eventually uh, could be. So, so there's that as well. Um, and, uh, but other students, you know, who are not interested in going further into academia do take, uh, do write a thesis uh, for their own, you know, um, uh, uh, kind of peace of mind, right? I mean, they, they want that, they, they want the challenge and they want, they feel like a thesis is something that they want to do. Uh, of course, if you write a thesis that goes into the, uh, is, 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 uh, uh, um, put into the, the library and so it's available for people to look at um, and so you know you might have more a, a much larger um, audience and readership if you if you go that route as well so um, I, I think it's you know it's very important to talk about also you know what you can emphasize within the public history um, emphasis uh, we have a uh, a, a wide range of topics and experts in our faculty that are capable of, you know, looking at, um, you know, regionally speaking, I mean, we, we, we sort of cover most of, of the world. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of themes, you know, a lot of our, our, our colleagues uh, write about or are experts in uh, economic history and political history. Um, if you want to get more and more compartmentalized and specific, uh, human rights, uh, political violence, um, social justice, uh, environmental history, um, uh, memory, oral history, testimonies, things like that. So um, we have the capacity to, to train uh, students who are interested in, in those and many other topics and, and hopefully cater the program to to uh, to them as well so um, the opportunities are are quite um, big here um, this is a smaller program whether you go the public history or the or the, the masters history masters route uh, it is a small program um, and um, that has a lot to do with demographic changes in demographics and funding and all that other stuff um, but um, you know as opposed to other programs that might have, you know, 20 or so, you know, per cohort, um, we're much smaller. We have roughly between 10 to eight or so, um, which I think creates a, you know, camaraderie. It creates a more kind of intimate community. Um, a lot of our uh, uh, um, students build this kind of um, uh, uh, camaraderie, you know, with uh, with their with their with their with, with other grad students, not only in the history department, but elsewhere. So um, there is that benefit to it being kind of this, uh, not, not a, a huge program, right? Um, so uh, one thing I'm sure that you're concerned about <laughs> is how do you pay for this? Uh, so uh, the, the grad school is the, the the entity that sets you know costs and requirements and all that stuff, but um, in order to offset those costs, we do offer some funding, right? And that can be in the form of te teaching assistantships or researchships or internships. Um, we don't offer what you would what, what's considered to be a, a full ride, right? But um, you know, as, as money can becomes available, uh, if students, you know, don't ac accept our offer and they go elsewhere, then that opens up money. So we have had situations where students get a good, a good um, funding, funding package and um, are able to at least pay for half of their tuition or half of their, uh, uh, you know, t tuition and fees or have just kind of this extra stipend maybe on top of that. Um, you know, but it, it, it's not, you know, a, a program that is able to offer full ride, so to speak. So, um, and, you know, you'll find that more and more common in, in MA programs, uh, not only in 
the humanities or social sciences, but also elsewhere um, in, other, in other majors too. So, um, so anyway, so that's kind of my, my spiel there on uh, the master's program and, and the public history emphasis. It is something that is constantly in kind of in movement. Uh, you know, we, we have a very dynamic public historian, public yeah, history historian uh, right now who is, you know, um, is coming in with very good ideas and ways of improving the, the emphasis. So, you know, we're looking forward to really emphasizing uh, this, this, uh, this MA, um, which, you know, hasn't, you know, could, could use a lot of, of, of support and, and, and advertisement and not only reaching out to UNI students, but also to, to students outside of our sphere of influence, so to speak. Um, but in general, the program is um, kind of rebuilding itself. And um, uh, like all programs, we have, you know, large cohorts and then small ones and a kind of a mixture. So it's kind of hills and valleys of that in that respect. But um, we have been very successful in um, producing what we think are, are well-trained, prepared, well-rounded um, uh, MA students who, regardless if they go into academia or they go into public history uh, or library studies or, or something else, um, uh, some other vocation, we feel very happy with, with uh, what has, what has um, come out of, of, of the program. So. I guess that's all I have to say. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Calderon. That is, I think, um, yeah, a wonderful description. And um, I know Eliza, uh, for instance, is considering uh, going on to a PhD later. And um, back it way back, I think, uh, it used to be, you know, you could you go on to the PhD um, alone and certainly consider that, but a lot of programs now do expect you when you pursue the PhD to come in already with an MA and that can be, um, and it can also be a step up if you already have an MA, right? You already have some of that training uh, behind you. Yeah, there's always that benefit, you know, but, um, you know, it's not to say that uh, if a research paper, there's no, I mean, there's no shame in that, you know, obviously, you know. Yeah. Um, sometimes, you know, um, that's just the, the route that you decide, um, which, is, which is totally fine. We're, we're still, the, the, the faculty and the department and myself will still support you regardless. There's no difference in, in how we treat oh, students yeah. that they're doing the research or something, you know, the research paper. Um, uh, I at least hold them to, you know, like I said, everybody does hold them to, to high standards. But um, and but but some people are also you know the research option is also there for um, you know teachers who maybe don't want to write a thesis or don't have the time to do it. Um, there's uh, 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 non-traditional students you know who also see the the, the, the non-thesis option as an opportunity for them to complete a master. So um, it is there for anyone who wants to to do that. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of go through um, just a couple of the courses that I'm teaching, really, and that I think work well with public history. So a couple of you, Eliza and Kelsey, are actually in my intro to public history uh, class, and uh, one of the things that I really try to emphasize in this class is that um, all of our students come out of this class with some kind of final project that they can actually put on their CV or resume. So this semester we're using ArcGIS story maps um, to create exhibits about you and I history uh, specifically. But other things that we do in this class, and I'm hoping that both of you are enjoying it, um, is really getting a theoretical basis and grounding in, in a variety of topics in public history. We've talked about everything from uh, shared authority to cultural heritage, uh, monument studies, um, house museums, um, and other things like that. And we've also had a uh, interesting and a varied group of guest speakers um, and these are just some of them who are coming or will be coming. We've had Dr. McGill who has come and talked to us about her work in Belize. 
Uh, we've had Dr. Adam Dombey, who has come to sp speak on his book, The False Cause, which is a book about Confederate monuments. And then this week, our guest speaker is actually uh, Mr. Adam McNeil, who is a PhD candidate at Rutgers University uh, and a, the host of the um, New Books in Afro-American Studies podcast. Um, I'm also teaching a class in the spring, which is the uh, museum studies class. Um, if you are interested in the public history minor certificate major and if you want to actually even sub in this class for intro to public history, um, after talking with Dr. McNabb, she can uh, certainly do that. So this is the other course that you can uh, take. Um, and this course, we're going to take, again, a very broad and interdisciplinary approach to um, museum studies. Uh, we're going to be looking at archaeology, anthropology, um, art history, and how all these fields inform uh, the, the museum. Uh, and our readings will be centered around key debates, including um, museums and community activism museums and decolonial thought, decolonizing. What does it mean for a museum to be a colonial entity and how do we deal with that legacy? Uh, as well as material culture studies in a heavier focus than we have done in the public history class. And in that museum, uh, I'm also working to have a kind of a broad slate of guest speakers uh, from local, national, and national museums and historic sites and maybe, um, so, fingers crossed working this out, uh, we will even have the curator um, of uh, Oxford University's museum come talk to us about the Benin bronzes. So, yes, fingers crossed. Um, the other, I think, real strengths of our program in terms of public history is the a number of internship opportunities um, and I think relationships, uh, strong relationships that we have built uh, with different historic sites and museums in the area. These are just really good apprenticeships for all of you to get your feet wet in what it is that you want to do with public history. Um, some really strong partners we have include the Cedar Falls Historic Society, as well as Teaching Iowa History, the Grout Museum, and John Deere. Uh, but we've also had students go on and apply for very uh, competitive um, internships in uh, the National Park Service, um, and in, in just other programs. So this coming um, semester, the spring semester, um, these are the internships that I know we will have available locally, some spots in each. Um, and those are right now with the Grout Museum um, here in Waterloo, uh, the Cedar Falls Historic Society uh, here in Cedar Falls, Teaching Iowa History, which is a uh, program run through the Iowa Museum Association um, in coordination with uh, Cindy Sweet, who is the director of that program. Um, and that is a really neat digital program that provides K-12 teachers with primary sources as well as lesson plans that fit the Iowa social studies curriculum. Uh, well, I also have opportunities now uh, at Webster City which is about an hour and a half away from here. Um, and then at Special Collections at University of Northern Iowa. Um, of course, if you want to do something that is not at one of these sites, um, contact them, contact me, and I will try to get you in touch with uh, somebody else. Um, because of the pandemic, many of these internships will also be ones where you will work more remotely than on site. Um, and that is for everybody's safety. So um, my kind of summary of everything, um, why should you become a public historian at UNI? We, I think one of the real strengths of this program is that we're really giving you concrete and sellable skills, both in the work that we do in the classroom, in the research papers and the theses, but also in the internships and the way that you get to work in professional museum settings. 
Um, I think becoming a public historian is a great way to work in the history field. If you've always loved history, if that is the thing that you're really passionate about, um, working in public history is a way to continue doing that work outside of going into K-12 education or uh, into the academy, as it were, trying to go that full PhD route. Um, it's, you have this ability to work in this very new and cutting edge field. Public history is a field, uh, professional field is only at this point about 50 years old, right? Develops in the 1970s. Um, and we're still really learning how it is that we tell community stories and even the formats of exhibits, especially as we get into the digital age, um, are constantly evolving. And um, finally, as Dr. Calderon said, we have had really good success with alumni um, placement. So.